from MCIE. The connection between inclusive schools and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. My name is Tim Villegas from the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education, and you are listening to Think Inclusive, a show where with every conversation, we try to build bridges between families, educators, and disability rights advocates to create a shared understanding of inclusive education and what inclusion looks like in the real world. You can learn more about who we are and what we do at mcie.org. On this episode of Think Inclusive, I speak with Simone Morris and Julie Kratz, the hosts of the Inclusion School podcast. Simone and Julie connected over social media in 2015 and decided to collaborate on a podcast to talk about the connection between inclusive schools and the DEI space. Here's what I cover with Simone and Julie in this episode. Why diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are important in schools. Some ways to show up and be allies with people who have been historically marginalized and why it is important to talk about issues of racism, sexism, homophobia, and ableism with children. Before we get into today's interview, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Together Letters. Are you losing touch with people in your life, but you don't want to be on social media all the time? Together Letters is a tool that can help. It's a group email newsletter that asks its members for updates and then combines them into a single newsletter for everyone. All you need is email. We are using Together Letters so Think Inclusive patrons can keep in touch with each other. Groups of 10 or less are free, and you can sign up today at togetherletters.com. Thank you so much for listening. And now, my interview with Simone and Julie. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, same. Excited to be here. I had the privilege of being on the Inclusion School podcast, and we had a fantastic discussion about inclusion, schools, uh, diversity, and we wanted to have Simone and Julie on to talk about the connection between inclusive schools and the DEI space. And so to get us started, will you and whoever wants to go first, Simone or Julie, would you please introduce yourself? to our audience of inclusionists. Sure. Happy to kick the ball off. My name is Simone E. Morris. And first and foremost, I'm a mom of a seven-year-old daughter, and I'm a DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner. I've been doing this work since about 2009 in the corporate space and then on my own since 2015. So happy to be here. Happy to engage in this uh, rich conversation. Simone, that's so funny. I didn't know. It's so funny how much we talk and how much I learn because we started our businesses the same year, 2015. So, And uh, oh, I have an eight-year-old. and uh, We've traded notes a lot about uh, the adventures of Jane and Millie. Um, but that's why and Dylan, I... And Dylan. Oh, and yeah. Dylan. I can't forget about my almost two-year-old who's oh, such a joy and a challenge. But yeah, I mean, we both did this work for corporate for a long time. And when we connected through social media and saw that we were doing similar but different things, we thought, hey, we need to have this conversation earlier. We need to to talk to our kids about it, but both of us were struggling and we thought if we're DEI people struggling with this conversation, <laughs> there's probably a lot more people struggling with this conversation. So we're uh, 60 episodes in and counting and so excited that Tim and others have shared their expertise with us. So you connected over social media and then decided, hey, let's do a podcast? Yeah. That's right. kind of how the story goes, Simone, right? <laughs> well, we're, first of all, we liked each other a, a lot and we still do. So that happens first. And that's like, <laughs> we have got to work together. And what are we going to do? And so a podcast and a book later, and I'm sure there'll be more to come. So, you know, we just liked each other a lot. Yeah, we had multiple conversations. I think it was that first conversation where there was some weird stuff happening in both of our kiddos' schools. And we're like, hmm, this is a thing. This is a thing still. And I think both of us kind of thought like, oh, these kids have it figured out. Like we're focused on, you know, people in the corporate space that really don't have it figured out. And so I think both of us were like surprised, uneducated ourselves. Like I, you know, I remember when Simone and I first talked, this was 2019. So this is, you know, before the summer of 2020, the infamous summer where everyone 
you know, really you know, tried, I think, to get involved. But even then, there just weren't a lot of tools. There wasn't a lot of information. Um, we found these amazing people in just pockets of, I mean, all over. We've interviewed people from all over the world. And I've been like astonished to see like there's an amazing amount of children book authors that talk about diversity, but they're not mainstream. You know, it's not something that's like always at the bookstore, or Amazon cart. And, and people that study this work and go into schools and have these conversations and educators are coming up with their DEI plans. So it's been super cool to be surprised and, you know, scared and <laughs> I think affirmed that there are good people out there doing this work. We need more of them though. Would, would you mind, could you share with us the, like you said, things happened at your schools with your children? It, are those on top of mind? Would Could you tell our listeners about that? Yeah, I think for me, it was, um, we had, Jane was entering elementary school and they had a DEI counselor or committee or whatever they called on this again it was 2019. Yeah. And I joined, you know, and I, I joined and then I look around as like all women, mostly uh, women of color and me and one other white lady. I'm like, well, this seems to be a problem <laughs> with representation. And then the representation of the school is quite the opposite, you know, like not a lot of kids color, very white dominated community. So it was really hard, I think, that year to be like, where's my place in this? I don't want to show up and be the DEI police, you know, because there were things, ideas that were being thrown around that I, they weren't the most inclusive. And Simone and I compared notes, I think, on just the absence of conversation at my school anyway. Simone didn't have to take charge at her school. But Black History Month and even Women's History Month, there was like no conversation about it. And then once COVID happened, you know, we just got completely distracted as a committee, which I mm. think we could have done a better job of staying intact. But there was just a lot going on then. So I think for me, it was wrestling with how to show up in the conversation intentionally and not as a savior, but as somebody that really wanted to help in a place that didn't have a lot of diversity, but could at least work on the inclusion piece and signaling that we wanted more diversity. Mm. And I think for me, Tim, I was commiserating with Julie. My daughter was about to turn four and she was in preschool and we had had this playground incident where this little kid told her that she didn't belong. And I was just gutted and wondering, wow, I knew I had to have a conversation, but that it, this is too early and I wasn't ready for it. And so talking to Julie about that experience and knowing that I wanted to move her to a school, uh, to a place with more diversity, because it was a predominantly white preschool. And, you know, I had conversations with the directors, teachers, etc. But felt like I wanted her to not be the only one in class. It, it's a, a big burden to be the only one, but to be three and the only one, it, it's it's pretty significant. So I ended up moving schools for her. And just on the journey, Julie and I have compared many conversations of this happened or they're not doing anything for Black History Month. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, how do I show up? And so I think over time we learned and grew on the podcast as well, because we're always having the conversation with our guests and we learn something and there, there, you can never stop learning in this space pretty much. Do you think because of the, I guess, attention that DEI has gotten over the last couple of years, I, I get, I, I hear on social media, sometimes people are like, now there's too much attention on inclusion. And why are we having to have all these DEI meetings and conferences and workshops? I guess, so here are my questions. Number one, do you really feel like that there has been an influx of of all of this content for people in your space? So that's the first question. And number two, is there a point where will we get to a point where we won't need as much? Well, I'd say the first question first, right? We that's that's the ultimate goal, right? <laughs> where it's just seamlessly integrated and it's not such a big deal, as you're saying. But the reason it's a big deal is because we all don't get it. So, I mean, there's so much to learn. There's a big boulder uphill. And just as soon as you think you get it, you fumble and stumble. I, I put my foot in my mouth or I didn't get that right. So there's a lot of people who are overwhelmed by what it takes to be truly inclusive. And so, you know, the world is changing. So we have to change as parents, caregivers, educators, as well as in the workplace as human beings. And we don't we don't all have it figured out. Look around the world and what's still happening. No. And I think if for people newer to the conversation, I, I think they thought like, oh, we'll, we'll tackle this this summer, this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, it's keep going we'll soon. wrap this up. 
centuries of inequality <laughs> not solved in the short term. And, you know, it will be solved in our lifetimes, what Simone and I have commiserated about. I mean, it makes me sad, but it also makes me feel obligated to help be a part of creating a next generation of allies. We need these kids to get it earlier. I was raised colorblind. That was super unhelpful. Um, we all see color, you know, and so to talk about, you know, incidents of sexism, racism, homophobia, you know, ableism, whatever isms at play is an opportunity to help our kids grow and learn and be better. And they're, at the end of the day, like we're doing them a disservice by keeping this information from them. Like it's just, they're <laughs> the global world right now. And it's going to be super global for them. And multicultural is one of the fastest growing demographics, especially for our kiddos. So they are going to experience this and are going to experience this quicker. Uh, they're going to get it quicker. And as parents, I think Simone and I have talked about this as parents and caregivers and educators. Like I think there's a real fear factor of that bumble and stumble that Simone calls it. I think there's a real, you know, we want to protect our kids. We want to be the experts. And this isn't something I know a lot about. So I'm going to, you know, we call it the dance. <laughs> dance about mm-hmm. it. And one of my favorite things that we share a lot often, like our tips is it always comes back to meeting kids where they're at, finding the space to meet them where they're at. And you don't have to have the answer. You can say, I wonder, or, I noticed, or did you notice? Like those types of questions or thought prompts are super helpful for the dance of that conversation. And then just open your ears and listen. I mean, if you talk with somebody in your life, whether that's a child, a you know, adult, so many work with personal and professional have a conversation about inclusion i think if we were just having more of those conversations things would happen more quickly but tim the forecasts are pretty grim for racial diversity and gender um equality like we're still you know at least 100 plus years away unfortunately and covid's kind of set some of that stuff back contrary to what i think people think just talking about it has not solved a lot of the systemic issues so in your roles in dei like how often does disability come up in that conversation conversation. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like, Simone, I'm curious from your perspective. I think most people go to race and gender. Um, and we we encourage people to broaden it. And we've had folks um, that talked about physical disabilities on the podcast, as well as cognitive disabilities, like neurodiversity as well. But that's an area I think we're a little weaker in on our podcast, to be honest. I mean, we've had several guests and it's something we're actively working on. But in particular, you know, as we're talking about through the lens of kids, like the books, there there's not a lot of great books that talk openly about ability and disabilities. I just happened to read one over the weekend about disability awareness. And so much of it is like the do's and don'ts, like the words to say and not say. And unfortunately, these are words I've like heard come out of my daughter's mouth already at, you know, age eight. So the stigma um, about it, Simone, I think uh, one of my favorite guests in the podcast, Deb Daggett, that you, oh, you know, yeah, she awesome. said, you know, I love what she said about it, like developmentally meet them where they're at. But like kids, you know, one of the, the most common situations that happen, this has happened to me with my kiddo, they're curious, they notice, and they point at someone in a wheelchair. Or Jane was actually shocked that a kid could be in a wheelchair. Like she did not know that was actually possible because she'd never seen it before. And so having that conversation, not shushing them, you know, pointing is probably not the best thing to do, but talking about, yeah, I noticed that too. And it's okay to talk to that person, and we should talk to that person openly and greet them as we would anyone else. Whereas we usually avert our eye contact, you know, we're afraid to say or do something. If kids are curious, it's okay for them to ask a curious question in a thoughtful, respectful way. Don't shy away from it. Don't shut your kids down because then they learn not to talk about it. And that continues later in life. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's a great point, Julie, because just because we are uncomfortable or thinking we're doing the right thing, like, shh, you know, it's not necessarily the right thing to do. So again, back to that dancing with discomfort, you know, being uncomfortable and, and having the conversation and admitting you don't know. I don't know because we've had, um, I'm forgetting her name right now. We have this little girl. We've had a couple people with different abilities on the uh, Inclusion School podcast. I remember we had a little girl and, and, and we, we're talk, we talked to her and her mother, not remembering her name right now, Julie. I don't know if you remember her name. And she's got a YouTube channel and all this stuff. And it, it was just very educational for us to have the conversations and to even have the conversation with parents about their experience and, and what promoted their activism 
really was enlightening for us. So I think we're starting to see more of, I, 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 I wouldn't give us a, a D, Julie. I might give us a C on the Inclusion School podcast that, <laughs> that you know, because I, I, you know, we've had different slices of abilities on the podcast. We've had the expert level, we've had the child level, we've had the parent level, and we've even had educators chime in on some of that in the classroom. So we've got some resources. And I think in my day job, if you will, it comes up. It comes up in employee engagement survey where people are wanting a broader reach of what the focus is more than race and gender. So I think we will see a lot more around abilities and and making space for abilities in the workplace. Yeah, one of my favorite podcasts, and not the one you were thinking of, although I know that's a season one or season two where we talked to the I'm, the kid I'm with looking the it up now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, good. Well, one of our most popular podcast episodes, Mike Hess, remember? Uh, he, yeah, I love that. Loved it. Yeah, yeah. And he, he goes into schools and talks with kids about his, you know, blindness and, and talks very openly about it. So then they're not afraid when they see somebody that has, you know, a seeing eye dog or, you know, has, you know, clearly the lack of vision. So I just loved his stories because like you can make it fun. I think with disability, there is a natural vulnerability that comes with it. I think that scares us is because any of us could get a disability at any point in our life. Like it's unlike a lot of the other dimensions of diversity. Like you're not going to change races or ethnicities or your gender can be fluid, of course. But for disability in particular, like that could change for me this afternoon. And I think that that creates fear for parents because we don't want to think about things that could cause us pain or, you know, attack our morality or or, you know, our ideas of it. So I do think finding ways to reduce the stigma and to open up the conversation and to talk about it as, you know, it's not a negative thing to be pitied. I think that's something I've really wrestled with is I was conditioned and taught that to to pity, you know, to, to go in that savior mode. And that's absolutely not helpful with any dimension of diversity, but very important to remember with disability. I think, you know, in our space in inclusive education, we've got misconceptions that we tackle all the time, but I would love to know in your space, what is a common misconception about inclusion? <laughs> I think people think it's going to be like this really hard conversation. Oh my gosh, we're going to have to sit down for like two hours and talk at length and cry. It, you know, I find most often, I'd be curious, you know, what you find with Millie, but with Jane, I mean, my two-year-old can barely have a conversation. So we're not, we're not there yet. But my eight-year-old, and this has been since she was probably five or six, we have talked about things we've noticed or things we could do better or things we could learn about. Um, whether they're just going to like an, you know, a restaurant that's of a different culture than ours and talking about how people around the world eat different types of food or, hey, when we go somewhere, there's a lot of diversity of different types of people and sometimes there's not. And like, why might that be? And one of the examples I remember very starkly that really confused me at the time and I've learned about it since, but we went roller skating. So Jane um, really likes to roller skate. We had a birthday party at roller skating rink. And there's a lot of diversity. I mean, just lots of different types of folks that happen to be at the roller skating place and have one we've gone consistently. Well, then we go ice skating and it's totally opposite, right? It's mm -hmm. all white people. It, I think I counted one person of color. And, you know, we just, I, I was like, I noticed something. Did you notice that? And, and Jane's like, hmm, mom, I don't know why that is. Like, why, why would one place have a lot of diversity and why would another not? And, you know, I, I've unpacked that with my friends of color and I, I get how it's tied to socioeconomics. I get how, you know, roller skating, I've been told is a form of dance a lot of times in the Black community. And so it's just really interesting that, you know, comparing my perceptions to other people's perceptions, and everyone has different perceptions around this, but just noticing and drawing attention to it. I have found, Simone, I mean, it's not an hour-long conversation. Jane can't hold her attention that long. It's usually like five, 10 minutes. And then next time she's in a situation, she might notice that again. And not that we have to draw attention to it and have a conversation every time about it, but starts to notice places where people feel a sense of belonging and maybe a place where people don't. And how can we be more inclusive in those spaces? So that's something I think that parents, caregivers, educators struggle with. Or the kids are going to say something really inappropriate. Like they don't. I mean, you actually learn though when you listen to them. I remember Jane telling me like racism does not make sense, mom. Yes. And here I am trying to explain the history of it and how we came to be to this place. And she's like, that just sounds terrible, mom. Those are some bad decisions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just wish more adults could say that out loud. <laughs> Got quite a long simple, history, <laughs> quite a long history of bad decisions. <laughs> and it's not to oversimplify, but I think in a child's mind, like it's okay to say, yeah, that was absolutely wrong. That was absolutely wrong. And just sometimes that's enough for them. I think for me, it's a, 
it's about, it's not always outward. It could be inward as well. And what I mean by that is that uh, we're teaching our children how to be inclusive, but there could be scenarios where they don't feel included. And I don't know if that's more prominent for me because I'm, or my daughter, because we're Black. But there are instances where your child could feel like they're not included. It does not have to be a overt racism, you know, gender, et cetera, where kids just don't include them and giving them the skills to navigate when they're on the receiving end of not being included is something. I mean, I work at that a lot with my daughter um, because she's black. So (laughs) her experiences may happen more frequently, but it could happen to other kids where they don't feel included. And it's interesting, Julie, you talking about the ice skating, because I remember when we chose to go ice skating, we were the only black family there. And we're like, where is everybody else? And it was it, it was sort of, you know, I was kind of hoping for more representation, but there just wasn't. Our school had an ice skating activity. And we tend to, in our family, embrace opportunities for different experiences based on how different it is from what we experienced growing up. So Millie is very lucky. She's got exposure to being in Australia. I mean, she just had these experiences that it feels like I'm experiencing it as well when she's experiencing it because I simply did not grow up that way. But with that, there's a lot of lessons around how do you deal with not being included because perhaps you're not expected to be in spaces. And the other thing that came up for me is that we as parents can choose to not be in inclusive environments for Mm -hmm. sake of giving experiences. And I know that from a summer camp perspective, because I've had that experience where I've put Millie in a situation that was not diverse because of access and because of experience. And then when I tried to move her to a diverse experience, she was resistant because she likes the access and the experience and that opportunity. And so I wrestle with making the right decision, knowing what I know as a practitioner, knowing what I know as a parent, but you get to listen to your child and you want them to be happy. So I I think, you know, there's misconception that you have to choose diversity, but if you don't choose it, you have to come to grips with it and, 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 Perhaps you can bring some of your diverse experience and knowledge into a space that there isn't a lot of diversity. So that's something that I have you know, been thinking about a lot. Mm. More after a quick break. What can educators and families who want equity, who are pursuing inclusion for learners in their schools, you know, what can they learn from professionals like yourselves? It, because, you know, the people who listen to this podcast are mostly educators and they're interested in inclusion and in inclusive education. And we're, when I say inclusion, I'm talking about disability, you know, but really, and why I think it's so important for our listeners to hear, to hear hear your voices is I really want to connect those worlds of people who are interested in disability and inclusion and also, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So for our audience, what do you think, what what can they learn from, from you and in, in your space? Yeah, I think they're intersectional, like you said. I mean, it, when I've tried, and I made this mistake myself, like I, eight years ago when I started doing this work, yeah, eight-ish, it was gender. I'm a white woman and I'm straight, I'm cisgender. Right now, I have all my abilities. So I focused on my experience, my lived experience. And I think there's something to your lived experience, much like Simone just described with being a person of color. And, and that's a different lens. However, like you said, it's intersectional. Like when we when we look at disability, gosh, what a quarter of Americans have a disability, right? Like a billion people on the planet. So if we're not talking about that, we're only talking about race, we're only talking about gender and not the intersectional identities that often people carry, you know, especially for kids that are going to see these lenses as just human, parts of being human. I think that's really important that we look at the different aspects and the nuances of each one of those different lenses on the lived experiences because they do look and feel very different. You know, Simone, feel free to build off of this, but I, I was just thinking it's like for educators, you know, one, one of the things we do in the corporate space, and so I can't speak to what educators do, but much like Black History Month, December, early December is Disability Awareness. Um, I know there's a national day and I believe there's a calendar month in October that also 
addresses some of this. So that's an opportunity to write, to bring some content, I think, into your classroom or to consider just having a conversation about what a disability is and words to use and not to use. Because a lot of times, you know, people still use, I don't want to use these words because they're outdated, but handicapped, that's just not a word we use anymore, right? Um, and kids may not understand that because they might have seen like their parents say handicapped parking or something like that that's outdated language. Just simple things like that that I think you could talk about and how much disability affects children. Because like my daughter, if you haven't seen it, it's hard to believe it. And it would be hard to even know that that's something that's the thing. They're not going to be scared. They're not going to feel shame around it. They're going to learn. They're going to grow that people are different and come into this experience differently. Yeah, I'm going to go a different angle. It, for me, I think educators can leverage parents and caregivers as partners. And so here's an example for me. My daughter is experiencing differences in the classroom. So they they mix and mingle the classroom. So there may be a child in the classroom with different abilities. And I remember in preschool, she had a little girl that was in a wheelchair. And so they did different things during um, recess, et cetera. But there was no notification to me as a parent to be a partner of discussion. It was just handled in the classroom. So I think, you know, we're talking a lot about parents meeting children where they are. Well, there's some of that for the parent, too, because my daughter is learning these skills and I want to reinforce it at home, but I don't really know what the child has or any education around that, that's an opportunity for an educator to say, okay, you know, we recently received something, no birthday parties in the classroom. We've got a child with a nut allergy, life or death. We're not, we're going to celebrate birthdays in a different way. Please make sure you don't send anything. Peanut allergy. I mean, it, 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 that was a notification that came to all the parents. Well, if there's a child with differences and my daughter is interacting and she's saying, this person, this is not happening but this person is bothering her or whatever because they have a different skill set or ability and there's someone in the classroom that's helping them through that, but I don't know, then I may interpret that and create a totally different story because I'm not well equipped. I'm just hearing one side. So I feel like the communication and partnership, potentially there's an opportunity there. Mm. Yeah, I can see that for sure. The I can't remember who said it, but the fact that we don't have that many, like what I'm hearing is the experience of the, your children in school is that there's not a whole lot of interaction with people with disabilities. So isn't that a problem, right? Because if it's if it's so rare that we have to put a spotlight on it, you know, and shouldn't it be like I know I'm in I'm in my territory here <laughs> because you know that's what I, that's what we are promoting. We're, we're promoting inclusive classrooms where students with and without disabilities learn together side by side, right? But I mean, I'm also talking about it as you know from my experience as an educator. You know, when because uh, I taught in a self-contained special education classroom, so if one of my students, let's say, who you know has a disability is included in another class, it is sometimes so rare that the kids come home and be and they're like, yeah, this this kid is in my class and they're different and they did this. <laughs> you know, whereas if they were naturally included, then it wouldn't necessarily be such a big deal, right? I don't know. What yeah, do you think? I mean, ex exposure is part of the issue. I mean, we we as humans learn from the experiences that we're exposed to. And um, actually, Jim, when you were sharing that, I, I found the podcast that you're we talking about. The yeah, Danae I found it. Hooks. Yeah, okay, you found it. Journey, Journey's World. Yeah, yeah. yeah she her. explained her disability. Yeah, and I think about both of those stories. So, yeah, Journey talked about her own story from a from a child that was experiencing in perspective, and she shares her story, like, you know, publicly or you know, upon request. And Danae shares a story about her daughter, and her daughter is is unable to walk in a wheelchair and has Rett syndrome. And she takes her daughter with her to talk to kids about here's what she can do and here's what she can't do. And she said, kids. One thing I remember from both of those podcasts is kids are so curious in a good way about like, oh, what can she do? You know, like, how does she do that? That's so cool. You know, and it's like, that's the part that's neat, right? It's it's the the shunning or the, you know, diminishing of disability that makes they learn that right from us. So the more we can showcase those stories, and that, that's the beauty of what we learn with the virtual world. Like you can tune in, you know, as an educator, find these folks with their stories. Feel free to peruse our podcast, not to tout that, but there are some really great people we talked about. No, no, so, please tout it. <laughs> so these people, like they do guest speaking, they have books, they 
they talk openly about this and you can find content online that you can just bring into your classroom or better yet, bring them virtually into your classroom or in person at whatever that makes sense. So I do think finding those stories and, you know, the the folks that we've had on our podcast that have written books or share their stories are not hours long. You know, again, it's something you could easily weave into an existing time slot in your curriculum for the day, you know, 15, 20 minutes to talk openly about it. And that's I think something we've learned too, is this isn't the one conversation, the one you know, month of the year to talk about this. This is like consciously sprinkle it in, you know, once a month, commit to doing something with disability as an activity and use our podcast as a guide because this is a passion project for someone and I. So we mm. love to share the content or put you in touch with great potential speakers or books. Yeah. So uh, on that note, are there any particular, like you mentioned a, a few podcast episodes, but there are any other podcast episodes if, if people want to check out Inclusion School, where where's a good place to start? Yeah, I think going to our website, inclusionschool.com, either going to resources because, um, uh, you know, Julie's team does a great job of collating or curating the resources that we talk about on the podcast. So you can easily download resources that Julie and I have put together or additional resources that our, our guests have shared, whether it's an assessment or a list of books or whatever it is, you can get that. But also going to the episode and we referred to season two a lot in this conversation. So the episodes that we referred to about using Rett syndrome to teach inclusion, that's season two, episode 12. And we also talked about Journey's World, that season two, episode 10, Journey's World. You can have something about mental health, uh, season two, episode nine, when we talk about mental health awareness and support. So uh, we are very descriptive in the titles of our articles. So I think once you get in, and again, these are about 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes long episodes, you can just, you know, on your lunch hour or in the morning or whatever, get one in and, and just promote additional thinking or how can I incorporate this in? Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, there's a slew of web pages with uh, videos, books, podcasts. We try to link and promote other folks work. And I would just say too, you know, <clears throat> for listeners, if you know of somebody that would be a great guest in our podcast or you want to be a great guest on the podcast, we are always kind of looking for folks. Um, and so you can easily contact us through the website or just email us at talk to us at inclusionschool.com. So in inclusive education, in the in our language, we talk a lot about a belonging. And so I wonder in DEI or in your experience in, in, in working with businesses and in your own families, where does belonging fit when you talk about inclusion? I mean, I, I, I sort of gave an example when I talked about my, my daughter at the playground where the kid told her, I'm forgetting if he used, you don't, be I think that he said, you don't belong. You don't belong here. And so it is sort of close to the, does she feel included as a result of someone telling her that she doesn't belong? She, she, the, we use a lot of language around having a seat at the table. Um, so do I belong? So am I welcomed and a part of this? And how do you include me so that I continue to feel like I deserve to be here? So I, I, I think it's a close dance between inclusion and belonging, and they can support one another. Yeah, I know there's a lot of metaphors in this work, especially in the corporate space. And I think one of our favorites is um, Verna Meyer's Netflix mm. DEI leader, right? The the dancing at a party or just dancing, you know, like diversity is like being invited to the party. Inclusion is like feeling like you can dance, but belonging is like feeling like I can dance and not give a rip, you know? I can do the running and, thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> me doing my car wash dance. Ice skating so right Explain that, listeners. Yeah, me falling on my butt. Yeah, but it's it's a different feeling, you know. Even if the school was doing everything for Millie to feel included, that kid took all yep. that away yep. in five seconds, mm -hmm. and that just viscerally. I mean, for parents, caregivers, educators listening to that story, I mean, remember when you shared that phone? I was like, I am so angry, and it didn't happen to me. It happened to somebody I've just met, but it happened to a child like that. <clears throat> I mean, when you think about belonging, our kids all deserve. We all feel like we we need to, as humans, that's Maslow's hierarchy, right? Connection and belonging isn't far up the pyramid once you've been fed and have shelter. <laughs> but that's not enough, right? We have to connect and belong. We're a social species. So if kids don't feel that belonging and that more psychological safety as they grow up, that's a scary thing for mental health. And this is why we see higher rates of mental health challenges. And because if you're getting the 
those threats, those microaggressions or macroaggressions like that kid did your whole life, like that builds up and that weathers. We know that kids that experience diversity have, you know, a weathering effect that happens to them. And belonging is just so, so important. And unfortunately, you know, someone wanting to do workplace work, I've yet to reach a real culture of belonging, maybe small teams with big corporations like, yeah, nope, we're just not there yet. And we got to start hard. this earlier. Yeah. Yeah. It it's is. hard. It's hard. How do you create that environment? And I do think, you know, knowing your audience as educators, and we talk a lot with educators too, like I do think modeling that, at least in your classroom, your 20, 30 kids or hopefully not more, but I know many have more. Like, like yeah. how do you model that, that, that foster a sense of belonging so that all kids really feel like they can you know, be themselves, be weird, be themselves, whatever it is. Because we get those social cues from a young age and it's sad and you just don't get the most from people when they're filtering and covering and pretending to be different versions of them. Yeah. I'd like to thank Simone E. Morris and Julie Kratz for being on the Think Inclusive podcast. And please go and listen to the Inclusion School podcast. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Keep in touch. Send us a note, inclusionschool.com. Love to hear from you. Think Inclusive is written, edited, and sound designed by Tim Viegas and is a production of MCIE. Original music by Miles Kredich. If you enjoyed today's episode, here is one way that you can help our podcast grow. Become a patron and get access to ad-free episodes, behind-the-scenes posts, join our Together Letters group, and sneak a preview of MCIE's new podcast series, Inclusion Stories. Special thanks to our patrons, Melissa H., Sonia A., Pamela P., Mark C., Kathy B., Kathleen T., Jarrett T., Gabby M., Aaron P., and Paula W. for their support of Think Inclusive. For more information about inclusive education or to learn how MCIE can partner with you and your school or district, visit mcie.org. Thanks for your time and attention. And remember, inclusion always works. <laughs>